<laughs> so let's talk a little bit about this concept of border imperialism. It's the topic of your new book. Can you explain to the journal's readers what border imperialism is? Yeah. Um, so for me, the idea of, of borders um, was incomplete without kind of a, a deeper analysis about how they actually function. Um, and, you know, most kind of conceptualizations of borders, borders are just seen as markers of territory, if you will. Um, but in, you know, in the ways in which borders are experienced by people, um, they're a form of governmentality, they're a form of violence. Um, and they operate not just at the, at the site in which they exist, but they operate internally as well as much more broadly. Um, so for me, I was trying to find a way to talk about borders that really grasps their fluidity in some ways, mm -hmm. and at the same time their rigidity. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, the, the concept of, of border imperialism really is trying to encapsulate the ways in which borders um, function, the ways in which they govern our lives, and particularly in which they're really part of a, a broader system of power and empire. Um, and so for me, there's kind of four key concepts um, around imagining how borders work and, and conceptualizing how borders work. The first, of course, is that, um, you know, we can't talk about immigration as this kind of domestic issue, right? Because that's, that's how we've tended to look at immigration, is this mm -hmm. domesticated framework of um, how immigrants come to the shores, come to the borders, how refugees come, and then how the state manages mm -hmm. um, these migrant populations. But for me, it's important to look at the starting point, which is what creates a migrant what creates the displacement, what are the cycles of, the, of displacement and dispossession that create migrant populations. Um, so firstly, looking at those systemic forces like war and empire and oppression, gender persecution, etc., that are operating at a global level, um, that are operating asymmetrically, right, that are disproportionately impacting poor brown and black bodies, and particularly women. Mm -hmm. um, what are those forces of you know, economic imperialism, um, free trade agreements, militarization, particularly in the Middle East right now. Um, you know, the Middle East is home to the largest stateless populations, whether it's Palestine, Iraq, or Afghanistan. Um, you know, what are these forces, and how is the West, if you will, the global North, complicit in these displacements and dispossessions? Mm -hmm. um, and for me, that's critical because one of the ways in which the state talks about migration is not only to domesticate it, but to present itself as a benevolent. Um, manager of migration, right? So the state, we're supposed to be grateful that the Canadian government, the U.S. government, etc., is allowing and welcoming immigrants. Um, and this is something that immigrants internalize, which is why mm -hmm. for me, challenging borders is so important because it's also part of us. You know, I'm I'm a, a migrant myself. How do we shed that that um, that internalized racism, that sense of gratitude that we're supposed to have to the state? And when we shift the lens back onto the state as responsible. And culpable for displacement and dispossession and for managing migration and managing dispossession, um, then I think it is part of our process um, to, you know, um, uninternalize and mm -hmm. shed those kinds of, mm -hmm. um, those myths that we're told. Mm -hmm. And so for me that's a key part of conceptualizing border imperialism is to shift the focus from migrants and the processes that migrants take on um, and oftentimes the perilous journeys that migrants take on, and oftentimes the so-called illegal, irregular journeys mm -hmm. that migrants take on, and to place the responsibility onto the state for creating um, and managing, and in many cases causing death and killings and violence on migrant bodies. Mm -hmm. um, for me, there's, you know, um, quickly a few other pieces around border imperialism. Um, one is the, the connection to racism and the ways in which immigration increasingly is not seen as racially coded. Um, it's seen as more of like a legal debate, right? Whether you're legal or illegal, um, whether you're here, um, follow, if you're following the proper channels, right? And this is particularly the debate in, you know, Europe as well as Australia and Canada and the United States right now, is this difference, that this kind of, um, this discourse that differentiates between like the so-called legal migrant and the bogus migrant. Um, and for me, this is really coded, even though it's not explicitly so around race, right? Because um, even though we don't explicitly talk about, um, you know, anti-Chinese, anti-Japanese, anti-South Asian migration in Canada, when we're talking about migration, we are talking about race. And one of the ways in which we see this is the fact that um, communities of color are constantly seen as migrants despite their legal status. Mm -hmm. So in the case of many communities of color, um, even though those communities have resided on these lands for centuries, 
They're constantly um, depicted as the dual citizen, if you will, right? The Chinese Canadian, the Indian Canadian, the Muslim Canadian. And that, that dual status um, casts us as, as constant outsiders. Um, whereas white people are seen as belonging to Canada, right? No one really traces back where white people are from um, or, you know, which um, colonized ancestors white people come from. Mm -hmm. um, and that, of course, also displaces and continues to perpetuate settler colonialism because whiteness is not indigenous to these lands. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, that's just one of the many ways in which racism continues to operate and to just to be and you know to use immigration as a stand-in essentially to talk about people of color mm -hmm. um, and the struggles that regardless of legal status communities of color continue to face mm -hmm. um, the precarity the impoverishment the racism the discrimination etc um, and those you know those come out in different moments right so in, right now in the context of the war on terror it's impacting especially Muslim women in really specific ways um, the debates on the niqab. Uh, you know, this, which are again couched as debates about secularism and religion are essentially debates, uh, are racial debates and are racial forms of violence mm -hmm. um, inflicted on Muslim women's bodies. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, that's, that's another piece around, um, around border imperialism. A connected third piece is uh, the detention of migrants. We're seeing an explosion of migrant detention all across, you know, particularly Western countries and the links to border militarization, so the fact that migrants are increasingly being incarcerated um, essentially for the crime of trespassing a border. And it's really important to unravel how migrant detention works because it is so normalized, people have taken for granted that migrants should be incarcerated because they're committing so-called illegal acts, migrants are cast as criminals. Um, you know, media and politicians continue to regurgitate that notion of migrants as, as committing illegal acts. Um, you know, in Canada, we have over 11,000 migrants who are detained every mm -hmm. single year. It includes children. Um, Canada is increasingly adopting the Australian model of mandatory detention, mm -hmm. which means that, you know, again, people are essentially being thrown into jail uh, for this crime of migrating. Mm -hmm. And um, to me, that's at the core of, of um, challenging borders, because if we look at what is the crime that has been committed, it's literally the crime of trespassing a border, which is a completely artificial construct. Um, the state has imagined itself as an entity that can be harmed. <laughs> That's what borders have created. It's given the state um, this this personhood that yeah. is completely fake. Yeah. Um, and so looking at the ways in which migrant detention is part of the expansion of the prison industrial complex, um, how it is part and parcel of, you know, this ongoing war on brown and black bodies that operates through different logics. Um, you know, the war on black bodies in particular and indigenous bodies in particular, the over-incarceration of of um, black communities, of indigenous communities, is happening simultaneously to the expansion of migrant detention. Um, in Canada right now, in the incarceration of indigenous women and the incarceration of migrant, of migrant detainees are the fastest growing migrant, or the fastest growing prison populations. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, you know, racism underpins how that, how that incarceration is justified. And, if, and also, you know, particularly in the United States, but increasingly in Canada, um, you know, corporations are making a killing off of a migrant detention, and that's really important to name. Yeah. Um, you know, I just came from the United States and, you know, learned that there were um, literally quotas for, um, in, mi in migrant holding cells. So, you know, corporations that are running, mm -hmm. corporations like GEO that are running migrant detention centers have quotas for how many migrant detainees need to be in these detention centers. And when they're under quota, they literally call up ICE, the Immigration and Customs Enforcement, and say we're under quota. And ICE goes out and conducts a raid, right? And so there's a, a, a clear... It's like the policing technologies. Yes. yes. Yeah, and this very clear link between militarization and, you know, the profits that come from it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, after 9-11, um, there was a number of um, CEOs of, um, of, prison, of the prison industrial complex that operate prison companies who came out in the business pages of financial papers across the United States saying 9-11 will be good business for mm -hmm. us, right? So the self-perpetuating logic of needing to incarcerate people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so that's another key component of border imperialism. The final one is, um, and I think the critical one that's not often talked about when we talk about borders or is, or is not at least linked in this way, is um, how capitalism is racialized and the key role that um, capitalism and labor plays in the context of managing migration. So while it's true that um, you know, racism plays a huge role in underpinning the debate about migration, it's not the case that the state wants to get rid of all people of color because the state also needs cheap labor. Mm -hmm. 
and communities of color have typically performed that role at a global level as well, right? Of course, you know, yeah. the West relies on sweatshop labor, yeah. on cheap labor, etc. Uh, but it also needs that source of labor in-house. It mm -hmm. needs to insource what it typically outsources. Mm -hmm. So for domestic work and all the domesticated forms of labor, the state needs internal to its borders. And so migrants have always been commodified as a source of cheap labor. Um, and increasingly under the temporary foreign worker program, which, you know, Canada has, it's drastically expanding. Canada now accepts more people under temporary foreign worker programs than under permanent residence, which really is a challenge to this myth of Canada as ex being so welcoming to immigrants and accepting permanent residence is not true. Um, increasingly people are coming as, you know, indentured laborers um, under a program that's, you know, in migrant workers' own words, a form of modern day slavery where people, um, you know, live in egregious conditions, have no access to work, to basic labor standards, live in worker compounds, um, have their travel documents confiscated, and again, are indentured, are indentured labor. Um, and this pool of labor is so vulnerable. Um, again, because people are, are cast as foreigners and temporary, and so readily deportable, um, and, you know, at the whim of the employer, the employer can get rid of them. Um, you know, this, this program fills a really critical need within the Canadian state and for Canadian capital, which is to ensure a constant cheap supply of labor mm -hmm. um, while maintaining this racial hierarchy mm -hmm. of whiteness, right? Mm -hmm. And so it resolves this kind of core contradiction, if you will, of how to keep Canada white, how to keep Canada hegemonically white, mm -hmm. um, and to maintain white supremacy, but needing brown and, bla and black folks to be within the nation state. So how to be in the nation state, but not of the nation state. Mm -hmm. And so the temporary foreign worker program really um, is that model. Um, and it's important to note that the temporary foreign worker program in Canada is actually being replicated all across the world. Mm -hmm. The United States has looked at it as the model to follow. Mm -hmm. So when people say that Canada has a broken immigration system, um, and I'm focusing here on Canada, but there's obviously many other examples we can draw on, but in the context of Canada, when you know people, including kind of liberal, Market justice activists say we need to fix this broken immigration system. Um, for me, the response is actually no, because when we look at it through a lens of border imperialism, it's the perfect system. It's actually serving the purpose it's meant to, which is how to serve neoliberalism and maintain racialized citizenship. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the key part: is that we can't, we're not fixing a broken system. Um, the system is functioning as it's intended mm -hmm. to, which is why um, challenging undoing, you know, challenging border imperialism and understanding it as a framework means that we come to a different place, which is not fixing or reforming the immigration system. It's completely dismantling it. Um, because one of the main things it does, in addition to you know, treat us as cheap labor and racialize us, is it also then pits us against each other. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Migrants are divided between the good, desirable migrant, the model minority, um, the one that will assimilate, integrate, etc., against those who aren't. Mm -hmm. Um, and so for me, the key around undoing border imperialism is understanding the way it works mm -hmm. and to also um, have movements not start to act as border agents ourselves. Mm -hmm. How do we not perpetuate those divides within our communities and act as border agents about who has the right to move mm -hmm. and has a, has a right to dignity? Um, and so for me, the challenge is also internal to our movements mm -hmm. to not reproduce systems of power when we decide mm -hmm. who's worthy and who's not um, and to undo border imperialism within our movements and our communities as well.